Hey, this is Zach, and welcome back to The Writing Desk. Uh, if you haven't listened to the foreword and introduction, I would encourage you to do so, but I wouldn't call them entirely necessary before moving on to the real story. They do provide some context for what I'm aiming for, but it's your choice if you want to skip that. So without further ado, I'll begin part one, The Song of the Isles. The prologue is called, What the Songs Never Said. Some days are long awaited though there are a certain type of people that, despite that weight, lose track of what day it really is. Nisan Polycus was one such person, an old Sith with a seemingly older mind. His thoughts often wandered to matters that might seem small to folk beyond the shores of his home, but were quite considerable to him. As with many of the Sith, Nisan busied himself often with garden work and leisure, though a hard day's work was not unheard of by any means. Despite his age, he was always involved in the neighborhood projects and festivities and was well-connected in his own right. Regardless of his living on a hill far away from the rest of the town of Minhir, and regardless of being a fair climb from the next house on the winding lane around the hill, and regardless of his old and sometimes surly nature, he never felt alone. A knock came to his door, and he slowly trudged over to it, barking that he would be right there as he straightened his back and hobbled to his cane. Leaning on it and cracking his back and knuckles, he approached the elliptical door that gave way to the world outside. When he opened it, he saw the bright face of a local young Sith by the name of Everett Bilburn. He was a pleasant youth, no older than 26 and even then barely out of his early years by Sith standards. He was energetic and almost bouncing on his heels as he waited for the door to fully open and reveal the old Sith behind it. Grumbling, Neeson greeted him. Oi, what is it, my lad? Neeson asked, raising one of his thick and furry eyebrows high above the other. Everett smiled widely at him and in his face was a sort of excitement rarely seen in those parts. Neeson was undeniably curious, but was not the kind to wait for answer. He poked Everett with his walking stick, asking his question again and finally gaining something for it. It's next week, Everett said, and the answer was most displeasing. Many of the older Sif had no taste for vagaries or half-stated truths. His face curled into a frustrated expression, the wrinkles on his grayish forehead redoubling until they appeared as a washboard above his caterpillar brows. Oh, is it, then? Neeson mocked impatiently, and placed his hand on the door to slam it in Everett's face. It is, and I know you'd never miss a festival. Everett was still excited, though his childish whims had nearly lost him the conversation. Upon seeing that he was very near to being shut out, he filled his statement to the rim and allowed it to flow over until Neeson's expression warmed and softened like a fresh roll in the oven. Neeson allowed his back to arch once more, no longer feigning any kind of youth, and gave a weary sigh before letting it fade into a hearty chuckle. His face reddened ever so slightly from the flush of blood and excitement, and what had been a very gray, rocky-colored skin grew a bit rosy. Well, why didn't you say sooner, lad? I have things to prepare, gifts to wrap, and a dish to bring. Leave it to me, laddie. Neeson's voice was thick with mirth, and his slamming of the door seemed less malicious and grumpy after that. Everett's smile faded slightly, though not in a way that showed any real decrease in his happiness. The small portion of it that had been feigned simply withered and returned to its normally joyous state. He headed away from the door and waved to the window, seeing that Neeson was just inside, looking through old stacks of books and trinkets to find something suitable. Neeson grumbled, but still gave a smile before slamming the shutters and closing himself off from the outside world. Heading away, Everett bounced on his heels, gathering speed as he moved across the dirt road and towards the lane. When he'd passed the garden and gone beyond the fence, he hung a sharp left and started down the hill. From the top of the hill, other small mounds rose far into the distance. It was a crisp, clear morning, and from the high hill in the east of Minhir, all of the singing mountains, despite their distance, could be seen. When the winds blew strong, even their far-off songs seemed to rise above the town. The subtle hums of strong, clean air. The sound of far birds moving between peaks rang high in the air, and the roaring of the ale stream could be heard from the base of the hill along the southern edge, running out to sea. Everett circled the hillock several times in his descent and moved on to alerting the next resident of the upcoming festivities. Many of the Sith lost track of important days. They weren't empty-headed, but had little love for scheduled events. Their lives were often very in the moment and without care for preparation. The only real exceptions were, of course, the festival each year and the birthday celebrations. Birthdays, being reserved for small groups and close relations, were not often remembered by the attendees. It was the responsibility of the yearling to go and remind his guests of the day of the festivities. A similar thing was done with the festival, 
but all whose birthday would fall on said day were in charge of inviting their communities. The populations were fairly sparse, but most towns had at least one person with the birthday in question, and those that didn't were often excluded by their own lack of planning. It was never a sensitive matter, though, for one to miss a party of any sort. Even the festival, being of important religious and cultural value, was an easy enough event to ignore. Everett reached the second house and greeted the pair of sifts in their yard. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Garrick. It's one week to the festival, Everett said with more forced enthusiasm. They smiled at him, though there was somewhat disappointed expression spread across their faces. The girl, a fairly tall and slender Sif, put a hand on her belly and rubbed at it thoughtfully. Can't promise we'll make it, dearling. Oh, and Garrick sighed, though it was guiltless and not saddened. It was a more relieved sigh and held no ill will for his wife or situation. As was typically customary, Everett was referred to as yearling on his birthday and the surrounding time, and was highly respected and revered for that day. Even the dregs of Sif society were respected on their birthday. It was a strange cultural custom, and while it might have fit well for warring races who never knew if the next year would be a given, it hardly fit the peaceful and simple Sif. Everett nodded respectfully. His eyes, very large and ringed in Viridian, seemed thankful. He turned away and waved back at the others. Everett felt the smallest sting of joylessness in his heart as the couple turned away and mirrored the wave behind them. Their gesture was a form of long-held grief and worry. It insisted that in the past, a loss marked them deeply, and a reminder of that loss was soon to appear. Everett knew the reason. The Garricks had lost a son two years prior, and though it was at a different time of year, their remembrance of it soured their moods. Everett's smile faltered for the briefest moment before he dragged the corner of his mouth high again through will and expectation. Everett's face paint was smooth despite the messing up of his face, his bright eyes stared ahead, but his mind lingered in its place for a few moments. He tried to return to his joy and expectation. He allowed himself to be filled with the thoughts of the celebration to come, and all the stories. Oh, the stories. How they'd delight. It was a beautiful day, and as a yearling, it would certainly be noticed if he allowed events like that to alter his mood or behavior too much. The Sif paid close attention, and gossip was just as common as food to most of them. They were storytellers by nature, and adored a good tale when it was spun properly. He started to walk again down the lane, eyes locked on the mountain peak on the coast to the southeast. As he circled the hill, he looked at each peak in turn, basking in their resilient beauty. Their snow caps glowed like precious stones in the sunlight, and their green bases flowed outward into wide hollows that dotted across everything from Minihir to Fairhill in the west. The wind came to greet him from the front as he stared towards Fairhill, where he would surely be before the week was done. His sandy blonde hair fled away from the oncoming breeze, dancing across the gust before falling back down against his back, tickling his shoulder blades at the tip. The sun shined brightly down, darkening for only a moment as a stray cloud floated along. When the light returned, it seemed somehow brighter than when it had left, and seemed to show the smoothness of Everett's skin more clearly. The pale blue flesh across the bottom of his tall cheeks dimpled from the smile that he wore. He moved along the lane, visiting all of his neighbors in time to inform them. He saw half a dozen of the Birchwall clan and greeted each by name. Respectfully, he bowed to Norim, Sarah, Michael, Windsor, Lada, and Gabe, going by age from oldest to youngest in turn. Norim stepped forward, and on behalf of his family, he greeted the yearling alone. Once informed, they thanked him heartily and headed inside of their house to start preparing their gifts and tributes. As was the case with many Sif structures, it was not what most beyond the sea would consider normal. It was a tall, cylindrical chamber with a swirling staircase of wooden slats that led three stories up before blooming into a wide canopy sort of structure. Almost like a mushroom, it seemed to dig skyward in the shape of an arrow. All of their home was contained there in a single floor, save for the large water reservoir that was placed above it, carved into and affixed to the hillside. Again, he went on his way, though after being greeted so well and so warmly by the large family, his smile was less forced from there. He went to the Rivertons and knocked on the door of the two-pronged, spiraling tower where the old woman lived. He went to the Maplers and greeted the young couple outside of their home, a large boulder that had been hollowed and made comfortable. He saw the Tegans, the Sycamores, the Gantries, and the Wimbles. At each home, he glanced over the structure and appreciated them. It was common enough thing among the Sif to appreciate the architecture around them, and their appreciation for the beauty of nature when used right knew few bounds. 
At the end of the lane, some miles from the hill and after a dozen more families, he approached the small cottage near the River Delta, where the wine brook and the Alestream rivers met before heading out to the Sea of Prender. The home was small, but quite cozy and well tended from without. It was tucked a few dozen paces from the main road off of a slithering path through the trees. A few had recently been trimmed, and their trunks branchlessly decorated the area around the quaint yard. The building itself was built of massive, arching trees that seemed to fold into a single structure as they grew upwards. The Sith prided themselves on adapting nature into homes without doing much damage. Carving through rock was hard work, but common among them, as many boulders around the base of the Seeing Mountains and the many hills proved to be sized well for a small family. Others would use wood with minimal damage or modification. Some were less skilled and carved trees into shape, using their branches for lumber and their trunks for a base. The Ardifer family was far more skilled than that. Julius Ardifer, the owner of the home, had spent many of his hundred years working with nature as a kind of Sif woodsman and carpenter. He was so skilled in practice that he could plant and transplant trees into a shape, slicing them and attaching their bare parts so that they would grow together. It was a lengthy process, but it made homes that could be hidden well, houses that were very strong, and houses that could heal from damage on their own. This kind of house was called a damel and was valued among the best of Sif structures. It represented both their love for nature and their love for creation, and very few could pay the price to own one. Everett approached the door, a large and rounded door placed in what had once been an open knot and knocked on it a few times, waiting and listening for any sound through the hardwood door. The sun hung high above him, and it was cool in the shadows of the canopy. He held his smile and glanced around as he waited, eyes landing on the freshly cut flowers besides the door. If he had questioned whether anyone was home, it felt answered. The door opened, and behind it stood a tall Sif with a much larger build than most. Where most were slight and weighed little despite their considerable strength, the fellow was fit in tone. Uncommonly, he had no paint on his face, and he let his beard grow into a pale gray goatee with a pointed end. His skin was a mix of pale gray with tinges of crimson. The man smiled out of habit and tradition, but his face was distorted by other emotions. In the back of the home, tucked into a corner, sat a girl no older than thirty. In her arms was a small bundle, swathed in blankets that shrouded it from view. A few dull whines erupted from it, but they were loving and happy in tone. Everett went through his normal greetings and made the festival known. Julius gave an uncommon response, far from normal tradition, and invited Everett inside. Nervously, Everett entered, not sure what to make of it, and took a seat beside the woman. Julius paced back and forth for a while, and when he spoke, his brogue was thick and his timber was brusque. I know we're not the closest of neighbors, Everett, but you're the closest house on the lane to my own, and I wish to ask you a favor, come festival day. This was absurd. A soon-to-be yearling having been asked for a favor on the day of his birth was all but unheard of. It was a very strange position to be put in, and sorely tested Everett's resolve to remain civilized. Julius continued, his mind was revealed through a few simple words. Young Findlay here is to be a yearling as well come next week, and I might have prior engagements that demand my attention. My daughter, Theodora, is often ill, and may not be able to bring him on her own. I just wondered if... Of course! I can check on them and make sure they're well enough. I'll even escort them. Everett relaxed. It was no favor after all for Julius, but a favor for a fellow yearling, one about to come to his first birthday. Everett's smile, having faltered slightly over the conversation, returned in uncommon strength, glancing past his fleeting emotions to widen and show his straight white teeth. Julius gave a relieved sigh and offered Everett a refreshment before he left. Everett refused pleasantly and took his leave with all of the haste that he could muster. To be invited into one's home without having asked first was rather strange and out of the traditional scope of greetings. It was so rare that Everett couldn't even remember having done it in all of his years. When he left, his chore completed for the time, he carried himself to the very end of the lane, another mile further, and reached the market that joined together the three hills that formed the whole of Minhir. He'd come westward from Thatch Hill, and the other two had been visible, even from there. They were now much closer and more noticeable. To the north, Barrow Hill rose, not quite so tall as Thatch, but still taller than the third. 
Sparrow Hill, to the southeast, was the shortest of the three, and could only be seen well because of the wide willow tree that blossomed on the apex. With Thatch Lane behind him, he started to pass the mingling crowds of Sif that would gather in the daytime, about the meeting of the lanes, and at their joining, an inn had been built to entertain the many passers-by. Everett had some errands to attend to, and passed along the crossroads with a healthy, pleased expression on his face. On their way past, Guilford Humboldt and Rory Elfor passed by. They were older fellows, well-versed in the ancient art of gossip and loose lipping, and they prided themselves on their skill. They were certainly not quiet about their complaints and conflicted viewpoints, and spoke with no secrecy as they passed. Hearing their small talk, Everett couldn't help but be intrigued, and so followed along behind them, listening closely all the while. World's gone mad, Guilford brooded loudly as he stepped along towards the Black Dragonfly Inn and Meadery. His companion called back in affirmation, though it wasn't even a word that he spoke, more of a snuffling grunt or a sigh. Did you hear about what happened in Lowfold? Rory had, of course, heard about what happened in Lowfold. As with all things, word traveled quickly on the backs of every Sif who traveled the land for any reason. Still, people continued to tell and retell the story, changing it a bit each time and adding their own flavor and sprinkles of untruth. The honest facts, unembellished, were not well known. Oh, aye, what's going on down there? Rory said in the usual manner. It was frowned upon to stop someone from telling their own version simply because it had been heard before, so Rory prepared for a different story from the various ones that he'd heard, Walking forward more as Everett, with notable interest, followed after them and listened closely, his form becoming obscured by a pottery booth. Everett's love for stories couldn't be denied, and in that he was helpless against the urge to follow and listen. So listen he did, and he listened well. Strange things, after all. They say men were on the shore after a shipwreck. Tall things, some of the shortest, were taller than everyone there, and from afar they looked dubious. In need, maybe, but that's not our place to say you're correct. They've long avoided our shores, but there they were, all the same. I'd heard that men would rather crash inside a hurricane than wind up in the sandy woods along the coast. It's strange, like I said. Guilford adjusted himself and opened the door to the Black Dragonfly. The pair walked in and were greeted with a hearty hello from a handful of other patrons, seemingly awaiting them. They sat down at a table where Earl Sanderson and Marco Daverish were already deep in their cups, wobbling back and forth as wine sloshed in their bellies, full and mirthful and awaiting gossip. Old Gil was just telling me about this news on the shore. Strange tiding indeed, Rory said earnestly, and both Sif at the table widened their considerably large eyes to look at him. Guilford basked in the attention and started anew with no shifts in his tone or verbiage. So these men, they mustered inland a bit, and there they told the local farmer that they meant no harm and were only seeking wood to repair their ship. Farmer scoffed at him, saying it was no right of men to use sift trees for their floating and bobbing and what not. Right out refused him, and the men weren't happy, not at all. From what I hear is they took their liberties right they did and found the nearest big tree to try and keep their business secret and small, but chose wrongly after all. Chose wrongly, did they? Earl rolled his eye. Tis easy to choose wrongly when plucking a tree from Sif land. Aye, maybe we're not violent, but we protect our land, and we won't have it spoiled, no, sir. Not by man hands and not by their axes. Right you are, but like I said, they took their liberties, not thinking none over consequence. They chopped down the ale willow, that brightest and best of trees far as Sif I see in Lowfold. But men have no care over our traditions or our loves and cut it in the night. But the old Sif in Lemoir heard the song willow cry, and her white sap ran long and hard into the earth by morn. Oh, those southern widelings, them and their brutish, thoughtless ways, Rory sighed, saddened by the retelling. Then off in the morning they went, and there was no mind to follow or make chase. We've no love of the big water, of course, and no Sif would drown him or herself for a folly like that. But the willow's lost, and now we must plant another to replace her. It'll be many a year before we taste the sweet, raw flowers of the ale willow on our tongues again. 
It'll be a sore generation, far as the flavor of our drinks is concerned. Speaking of... Guilford raised a hand with four fingers outstretched. Ales for the table. Willow flower brew and a rack of lamb. All the fixings. The whole group agreed on that matter, and they waited patiently for their drinks and late lunch. The food and drinks arrived, and around the platter of lamb sat two loaves of crusty bread and a large wheel of hard sheep's cheese. The shepherd's wheel, as the locals called it. They raised a toast, the first story of the night completed, and from it many more would surely spiral out. They savored every single sip of their drinks and let them rest in their mouths for long whiles as they waited for the sweet and floral taste to wash over them. Their tongues clung to the pleasant, sweet taste, and while ale was not this group's typical drink, they knew that such a treat, usually reserved for special occasions, might soon be gone for their lives for a long while. They supped on lamb over hard pieces of bread, and as was their way, they used no silverware to separate the meat or to put the morsels into their mouths. They used their long fingers and singularly sharp foreclaws to segment the meat, and then plopped it right in. They ate well of both lamb and bread before even coming to the cheese at all, and ate it beside the small bits of gristle and marrow rather than with the actual meat before them. As they ate, they all smiled, and another story was waiting on Rory's breath, tucked in his throat where it would peek beyond his uvula here and there. His eyes were bright with the desire to share it, and one-upsmanship inspired him to speak at last, despite the usual tradition of silence during the meat portion of the meal. He separated his fingers from the meat and set them to the cheese. With the dedicated knife, he cut thin slices in groups of four. For each one he intended to eat, he cut one for each of the others, leaving those and not touching them despite the ease with which he could have. Tradition was still strong for him, as one of the older fellows, and his amber eyes glanced back and forth across the others. He spread thin layers of marrow across thicker hunks of bread, placing the cheese on top and folding them into his mouth one at a time. Between bites and as the wrinkles on his forehead arched above his blonde brows, he started. You know, I heard some news from across the water in the northern lands, Rory said excitedly. The reaction was not what he wanted or expected at first. Somewhere beneath their surprised and almost incensed expressions, though, at least for some, was utterly bewildered excitement. Guilford sputtered, choking on a sip of ale, while Earl and Marco each gaped across the table. All four had similar skin tones of blue-gray, but they seemed to pale as they heard from Rory. B beyond the North Wash? Marco could barely hold back the twinging in his lip that pulled up on one side towards a smirk. Bah, strangeness is a good laugh, but there's no sense in talking over things that don't concern us none. We're people of the Isle. We've no reason to talk about... Gilfred started, but Marco and Earl both shushed him, frustrated that his tale might perhaps be overwhelmed by Rory's. Guilford stewed in his sudden dislike. I know you've nothing to say over what you don't understand more in your gardens and trinkets, so be still, be silent, and let him talk. You had your turn. Earl, the eldest of them, and the only one honored enough to risk a long, pale beard, spoke with a certain power that the others didn't hold. His word felt like law, and by tradition, it may as well have been. Everyone then waited for Rory to continue. Some were patient and excited while another was brooding deeply over his minor gripes. Well, now don't you go thinking that I know all about matters that truthfully don't concern me none, but I hears what I hears, and my ears were blessed at morning maybe a week ago to hear a tale I'd not heard before. He laid it thick, as new and unique stories were novelty among the Sith. He struggled to hold himself back, but was truthfully better his craft than Guilford could hope to be. For one typically so quiet, Rory had his pockets full of juicy gossip and it was a fresh telling with only one jump to the mouth of those who'd experienced it fresh. It was mostly truth. You know me, living by the wine brook and all, so I hear some strange thing from time to time, but this were a new kind of queer, and I made myself scarce to listen without being heard not. I was up by my house, or thereabouts to the north, and mind you, that's a far ride from here, even on a pony. But there I was the same, not five days ago. Where the river curves, I dropped my hook to find some supper for me and the missus, and both her wee ones. You know I'm not local, but I comes here to sell me nicens and talk good of the folk of the town. And I held this story close, I did, all the way from up there in wine country. So there I is, hook in the water, wishing patiently as one does while trying to catch a slick dinner for his kin, when I hear shouting up the river. 
Well, now I was quite sore to hear it, because the fish I'd been searching after had been bobbed off when the noise came down over the hill. I trotted up to where the hill was blocking view from me, and prepared to give my lungs a good workout. There I sees it, two sifts that I don't recognise none talking over strange business beyond the sea, and how they'd managed to cross the North Gap, wherever that is. I listened and shut me mouth, not wanting to spook them after all, and I waited for some juicy morsels to spread around. They were talking about odd business, some matter about the woods on the other side of the gap, and how things were happening there that seemed quite strange. And you know, didn't they mention that fellow Julius Ardifer and his brother Gardy? Everyone gave quiet murmurs over the business, even Guilford, who'd become so enraptured that he'd forgotten his distaste for better stories than his own. He just couldn't help himself, as this was a piece of news with not only intrigue, but with a local who people knew little about. So listen further, I did, and they mentioned something about oats and a stone, but not in that matter, no sir, they called it an oat stone. Strangeness indeed, and I wondered myself if it was some kind of other plant entirely, not oats in the least. So they say is that Ardifer should look after it, being that his brother died on the North Crops crossing. With his emphasis, Roy slapped at the table with his hand, and then drank deep of his ale when he was finished with the sentence. Everyone gasped, and lo and behold, six more Sif had gathered around to hear the tale. The room was all but silent save for the telling, and there was not a wizened eye around. No doubt flickered in their faces, and only wonder was expressed through those massive, brightly colored eyes which Rory watched so interestedly. So there I am, and I'm wondering all about Master Gardy, who you all know was a strange fellow, but nicer than most to his credit. And there's I wonder again about this gap in what or where it might be. Ne'er got a clue on that, though, as they'd moved on to other matters by then. For a while, they talked over simple things, about missing home and how they wanted to get their business good and done with. I just had to look at them, to see what theirs looked like, and bless me, I noticed when I looked closer that they ain't sif at all. These young men, young men with painted faces and wider than most men's eyes, and as I looked in, they were saying something stranger still than ever. Talking over business about some wicked oak tree past the North Wash. Seemed real scared of it. Scared stiff and wondering what might happen to him. So seeing their faces, shocked I was, and I thought my heart might give out. So I clutched at it, real quiet-like, but hear me they did and chased me homeward. Before long I was heaving at my front door and my wife had to fetch me water and hear me telling for herself, because she wouldn't let me lie down without explaining why I were so tired and such after all. He sighed having gone nearly breathless in his story's telling. But that's what I knows, and no more for now. Still, the wandering's there, and I can't help but be curious over those two small ones and what their business had to do with oats. The crowd get all gave a series of oohs and ahs, well pleased with the story whether it was true or not. The telling was good, and that much couldn't be understated by any. Though the others started to separate rather quickly from the group, leaving the four to their business once more. This was the birth of a strange story that would, of course, change and be molded by time in many different spins. People would speak of it for years to come, and wonder over the strange oak tree and the small men on the shore, if indeed they were men at all. With time, that part would go underrepresented, and these small figures would often be named as strange sifts rather than even stranger young men. People would also mix the two tales of the day with time, and the fishermen who'd landed to shore would be clashed together with the strange tree. As the story spread, it would gather steam, and it would become an oft-told legend about a strange day when a group of very strange men did an even stranger thing. Still, it did well in the living memory on the Isle of Song, and for years beyond counting, it would change. Further did it mold the view of men, and how they were wicked and careless, of how they had no respect for other cultures. Of course, that wasn't always true, but stories sculpted by many things in Haragath, not least of which was reputation, and not lesser was infamy. All right. Thank you for listening. This ended up being a lot of work, so if you made it this far, I really appreciate you giving me your time. I'll keep recording and uploading. I've got a lot of work to get through, so I have no shortage of stuff to do. Uh, but let me just thank you again for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day.